and welcome to the next in our series of videos on IFRS and IFRS corporates. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our global accounting technical team for financial instruments. I'm very pleased to be here today with Holger Meyer. Holger's obviously common to us from our German firm where he helps our clients there. Today we're going to focus on how financial assets are measured under IFRS 9. IFRS 9 has three measurement categories, amortised cost, fair value with changes going through OCI, other comprehensive income, and finally fair value with changes going through the income statement. And we'll talk a bit about when each of those three categories applies. Now in making that distinction, an entity has to look at two different kinds of tests. The first is a business model test. Why is the entity holding the financial asset? We talked a bit about that in our last video, where we particularly looked at a company that factored trade receivables or other debts, and how that might impact the business model test. Today we're going to focus on the second test. That looks at what kind of cash flows the asset has. Holger, can you tell us a bit more about that second test, the cash flow characteristics? Yes, thanks, Sandra. Well, under IFRS 9, financial assets can only be measured at amortized cost or at fair value through other comprehensive income if its cash flows are solely payments of principal and interest. This is commonly referred to as the SPPI test. The objective of this test is to ensure that only plain vanilla basic lending arrangements can be measured at amortized cost. Okay, so you said an asset needs to have solely payments of principal and interest. It seems pretty key what principal and interest actually means. Can you tell us a bit more about each of those? Yeah, sure. Well, there are these two, com these two components, principal and interest. And first, principal is the value of the financial asset at initial recognition. In general, this will be the amount of cash that, that is actually paid. Um, this principal amount may change over time if there are some repayments over the life of the, of the instrument. The interest, the second component, is first of all the consideration for the time value of money, then the consideration for the credit risk that a lender accepts, and then there are some additional other basic lending features that might be included. So for example, the consideration for the liquidity risk, consideration for administrative costs, and then of course the profit margin of the lender. The interest can be both, it can be positive or negative, so the mere fact that the interest rates are negative does not necessarily mean that the instrument would fail the SPPI test. I think in a way this SPPI test is quite similar to the assessment that was made under IS39 on whether the financial asset contains embedded derivatives that are not closely related. So for many instruments that contain embedded derivatives that under IS39 would have been separated, well, these kind of instruments would probably fail the SPPI test under IFRS 9. On the other hand, instruments that contain such embedded derivatives that are closely related under 39, for those it's more likely that they would pass the SPPI test. But of course, this is only a general idea, so there are exceptions in both directions. Um, one point as a difference to IS 39, under IFRS 9, if the instrument fails the SPPI test, the entire instrument is measured at fair value of profit or loss. Under IS 39, it was only the embedded derivative that has been separated, that the embedded derivative was measured at fair value of profit or loss, while the remaining host contract could be measured at amortized cost. Well, okay, so far for the general principle. Sandra, could you tell us a little bit more about those instruments that co uh, corporates typically have, whether they might probably fail or pass the SPPI test? Yeah, of course. So if you look at what most corporates have on their balance sheet, I'll start with debt instruments. The most companies probably trade receivables. Now most trade receivables will pass the SPPI test, so it could be an amortised cost. Typically a trade receivable has a repayment of the principal amount of, of the, the maturity date when the trade receivable is due. There may or may not be interest, there might be interest on overdue amounts, but even if there's no interest, the, the trade receivable can still be SPPI and be an amortised cost. The second thing is some kind of debt instruments. Corporates may buy, for example, treasury bonds or other short-term investments in debt instruments as a means of storing value. Now, those two commonly also will meet the SBPI test. That's irrespective of whether they have a fixed rate of interest or a floating rate of interest. Some of those kinds of investments have, for example, a floating rate of interest that's subject to a cap or a floor, maybe floored at zero, so the interest can never be negative. That too will meet the SPPI test. However, there are some things that corporates need to look out for. 
The first one I'll talk about is prepayment features. So if an instrument can be prepaid early, then that can meet SPPI, provided the prepayment amount is principal, accrued interest, and what the standard calls reasonable additional compensation for the early repayment. And there's quite a lot of debate going on at the moment about exactly what those words mean. So if you do have such an instrument with prepayment features, you do need to be careful and make a very careful assessment. Other instruments that will fail SPPI is where there's a linkage to something like the profits of the debtor or the revenue of the debtor, so some kinds of participating loans, those will fail SPPI because they don't just have principal and interest, they've got links to these other cash flows. And similarly, if a company holds convertible bonds, because of that feature which allows the bond to convert into shares, those aren't the solely payments of principal interest either, and they will fail SPPI. And those kinds of instruments, as Holger says, have to be entirely at fair value through PL. There's no element of cost there at all. Okay, so I've talked about holdings of debt instruments. Holger, what about holdings of equity instruments, shares and things? Well, equity instruments under IFRS 9 may fail the SPPI test. So, because it's just there are no payments of principal, no payment of interest, so they just fail this test. However, under IFRS 9, there is an exemption, an irrevocable accounting policy choice, to account for the subsequent changes in the fair value of these instruments, not in profit or loss, but in other comprehensive income. If an entity thinks about um, applying those exemptions, those accounting policy choice, I think there are two main points they should bear in mind. The first thing, the exemption can only be applied if the instrument meets the definition of equity in IS32. What's quite important is that putable instruments do not meet that definition, and hence they have to be measured at fair value for profit or loss. Examples of such putable instruments are investments in partnerships or investments in certain funds. For example, some of the money market funds, they would be measured at fair value for profit or loss. The second thing that's quite important is that the exemption only applies if the entire instrument is equity. So for example, if there's a convertible bond that only contains an equity component, the conversion right, then this instrument does not qualify for the exemption. It has to be measured at fair value through profit or loss in its entirety. So these are, I think, are two main things you should bear in mind, clients should bear in mind. If the entity eventually can apply this exemption and if the instrument is measured at fair value through other comprehensive income, the accounting is quite similar to the current accounting under IS39 for equity instruments classified as available for sale. There are, however, two main differences. The first key difference is that under IFRS 9, any change in fair value goes to other comprehensive income. So there is no longer a distinction between impairments, which go to profit or loss, and other changes in fair value going to other comprehensive income, as it's currently under IS 39. The second important point is that those amounts, once recognized in other comprehensive income, are never reclassified to profit or loss. That's also a difference to IS 39. IS 39 reclassifies those amounts to profit or loss when the instrument is sold. Under IFRS 9, that does not happen. It may be moved within equity, but there is no transfer to profit or loss. So does that mean that if a company lets the fair value through OCI, they've clearly got less volatility and profit and loss, but there are some gains and losses that just never get to the income statement at all? Yeah, that's somehow the price they need to pay, so they could um, avoid the volatility, but on the other hand, they have to accept this over the total period. And what about dividend income? Where does that go? This um, still goes into profit or loss, so um, this um, remains the same, as long as it is not one, one off dividend, one large dividend, amount of dividend. So just to recap, the rules in IFRS 9 are quite complicated, they're quite different from IS 39. Many debt instruments that corporates hold will meet the solely payments of principal interest SPPI test, so they could potentially be measured at amortised cost. But there are some things to look out for, in particular prepayment features, and whether cash flows vary with anything else, for example a participating loan or a convertible bond. As for equity instruments, as Holger has said, for most of those there is this one-time choice at initial recognition to either measure them at a fair value through profit and loss, so all the gains go to profit and loss, or at fair value through OCI. If you go that second route, you get less volatility in the income statement, but on the other hand there are some gains and losses that never go through the income statement, and all that will be there is dividend income. The final thing to bear in mind is that if an instrument fails SPPI, it's measured at fair value for profits and loss in its entirety. 
Unlike I-39 today, where you can separate an embedded derivative and have the host amortised cost, you can't do that anymore. That's it for today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time. And if you'd like to subscribe for the whole series, please click on the button at the bottom of your screen. Bye-bye.